somehow <clears throat> the good that went with the bad and that kind of a life was worth it and uh, just so free and do as you please, take from the land what you needed and no more, that the hardships didn't seem to <clears throat> hurt like they would today. We expected that. That was ahead of us. It was a part of our way of life. And uh, one would wonder how on earth we could stand those mosquitoes. And the deer flies, we call them, mayflies, and whatever. But knowing they were there and we were going to go through it regardless seemed to help us take the hardships. So in the end, uh, that way of life to me wasn't any harder, I don't think, than the people that's out there today trying to make it from day to day. It's almost impossible for a family to get married and raise a couple to get married and raise a family and a home and a boat. Uh, so they're seeing it hard too, and in one sense, one way of looking at it, our way really wasn't any harder. You had to be a tougher person, that's no doubt. A city dude couldn't have made it, but we were rough and that was just part of life. Lauren Toch Brown, navigating the waters of his beloved 10,000 Islands the same way he did as a child and young man, by the power of his arms. Born on Chukaluski Island in 1920, Touch is now retired, but retirement for Touch does not mean sitting on the porch or watching television. Many days it seems he works just as hard as he did when he was commercial fishing or gator hunting, probably because a hard day's work is all Touch has ever known. Touch says if he ever did just sit in a rocking chair, it would probably be the end of him. Touch's grandfather, C.G. McKinney, was among the few pioneering families in these islands at the edge of the Everglades at the turn of the century. He was known as the Sage of Chukaluski. Totch is today's Sage of Chukaluski, a man who wants to make sure the old ways of life in the islands are never forgotten. In this program, we revisit Totch Brown. In a 1993 program called Tales of the Everglades, Totch Brown's Life in the 10,000 Islands, Totch told some wonderful stories about his family, stone crab and gator hunt, and life in general. Since Touch frequently made reference to the hard life, we decided to return to the islands and focus on the day-to-day -day lives of people like Touch. This time, however, Touch decided to go beyond storytelling and recreate some aspects of life in the islands. In a time before roads, electricity, running water, telephones, and motorboats, everything about life in the isolation of the islands was hard. Cooking meals, doing laundry, getting fresh water were all major projects. Touch grew up with oars in his hands. In Chukaluski and the remote islands, the rowboat was the principal means of transportation. Even when boats were fitted with motors, few in these parts could afford them. So, while Henry Flagler's railroad was carrying well-to-do northerners to Key West, Touch was rowing. While Americans were taking the ferry to Cuba, some even flying on the fledgling Pan American Airlines, Touch was rowing. Even after automobiles, electricity, and telephones became commonplace in southwestern Florida, Totch was still rowing. In fact, he can still give a clinic on rowing a boat, and he built that little boat from scratch. And people think she must have got awful tired rowing, but it really wasn't that bad. We didn't, like if us turned around, just get down there and kill ourselves a rowing for everything we was worth. We sat on the shoving seat, we call this shoving, and we just shoved along. And to rest yourself, instead of both oars at the same time, we could do one oar at the time, like this. That kind of gave you a break. And then we could paddle. Paddling a boat is always best from the bow. Mm. You notice that I keep doing that. I handle this boat, keep this boat turned like that. So you, uh, 
you paddle like this. We done we done that paddling particularly when we we're going up the narrow creeks. And you notice I can show this boat either way like this. This is sculling. That's called sculling. You can shove it sideways and to spin it around, it's this way. And we had a little hole cut in the stern of the boat there or an oar lock like this, and we scull this way. You could really haul tail. <laughs> then we done like this. This was called scootering. Tonch and the other pioneers rode their boats to set nets, hunt coons, haul in fresh water, travel between camps, and enjoy a rare Saturday night in Chukaluski or Everglades. We didn't do that that much at the start because of the depression in my time. You just couldn't afford it. And, uh, but in the starting about 40, we all went to the, other than the churchgoers, we'd go to Everglades City some of us rode, but there was a couple of three power boats by then. My wife's uh, Uncle Jim Demery, uh, he wasn't about to miss a Saturday night movie. And everybody was welcome to go. His boat had all it would haul when he'd take off to the show. And my brother Bert had a boat also and he would take all that he could. So there was usually room enough to take what wanted to go to the show. And then we had the church goers go to the church. When we got to town, uh, after repeal, a lot of them got so drunk they never made it to the movie. <laughs> now, when you went up to Chukaluski, say, on a Saturday for an evening's entertainment, did you stay in town? Or did you bring the boats back that night? The only one that stayed in town is one got put in the pen for disturbing the peace. <laughs> Every couple of weeks, Totch and other family members would row into Chukaluski from their camps to pick up supplies at Ted Smallwood's store. Smallwood took over that store and the post office from Totch's grandfather, McKinney. I saw a wash tub and a uh, clothesline in there a couple of days ago. Don't forget that. Oh, okay. Come on, Dabra, let's pick up what we need. Okay. Morning, Mr. Smallwood. Good morning. Morning, Dodge. Morning, Dabra. <laughs> now, you said we had utensils and mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that we needed a basin. Okay. A dipper. Maybe a kettle. That looks kind of used, don't yeah, it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'll do. That's a good size. If I can get it without breaking that glass. Okay. Thanks. Good. I don't see a coffee pot, but I got an old one. It looks like you owe me a dollar fifty. Okay. Can we put that on the cuff for a day or two? Sure. I'll bring you some gator hops. All right. In the 20s and 30s, several people lived on Chukaluski Island and in Everglades. But there wasn't much work available. For many, living on remote islands was a necessity. We set up these camps determining on the season and determining on the game and the uh, gator hunting season, 
they used more back inland away from the coast. And we would set up our camps inland on the Shell Islands. And uh, so many people hunting, they would soon get them killed out around Chukalusky and reach for rowing. So we would uh, get set up for uh, several days at a time and row off down to where there's plenty of wildlife and set up camp and hunt the wildlife. Gators and uh, in the coon hunting season, they were both inland and on the coast, but never on the coast for the gators. So in the coon hunting, we'd set up camps on the sand beaches along the coast. And some areas <clears throat> had a lot better Coon, the coons had a lot better fur. The heavier the trees are, the better the fur is. Sun ruins the fur. They turn yellow, and uh, the darker the fur is, the better it's sold. And areas the coons grew bigger, and so you would favor all that in your camping and hunting ground. Today, Tatcha has a comfortable home on Chukaluski Island, but he hasn't gotten far from the old ways. Todd still has a camp on a small island, a place where he goes to write and remember. It was there that Todd showed us the kinds of camps he and his family built in the 20s and 30s. Well, if we were just camping out to hunt, for instance, through the winter, months to hunt raccoons, and you were living on Chukalusky, the home was on Chukalusky, and we were gonna go out to any of the families. We were gonna go out to camp and coon hunt. We uh, sold the fur to raccoons until Pearl Harbor. Uh, most of the fur went to Japan and Germany in World War II, wound that up and never been worth skinning here since. And so <clears throat> we would just get a few supplies and go to a place, either a sand beach on the coast or a shell island inland in the islands and throw up a lean-to, just a few stakes, four stakes up, four crossed, and then a few in between and lay a tarp over it if we had one. And many times we never even had the tarp. If it rained, we got under some old oil cloth or any thing we had, and a lot of times we just took it like a man, had a five-gallon can dry or a dry box to keep a little bit of stuff dry in. After the rain, we could dry up, and uh, we never had a whole lot at that kind of a camp, but a fire and a frying pan, coffee pot, and a mosquito net. Sometimes we couldn't even afford a mosquito net, didn't have one. <clears throat> But then on the, <clears throat> like you see back here, <clears throat> that'd be like when we were gonna stay at a place several months and actually live there. And then the only time we left camp, that was like our home, even though you had one, but usually when you built one like that, that's all you had. But uh, some now and then would build a pretty good shack for camping out several months, but for just a few nights, three or four nights a week, just a little, not much of anything. Captain Brown? Yeah. Why don't you give us a little tour of your island mansion here? <laughs> well, this is my shanty. We <coughs> usually start with a <coughs> lean-to, just a few poles and an old tarp or something thrown over the top have to get up and sweat it out in the rain, roll up your bedding. But then when we get <clears throat> where we're gonna kinda live for a while, rather than a few nights at the time, we got a little more modern like this, and <clears throat> this is uh, cypress poles. We like cypress poles mighty good. We go to the mainland, cut cypress poles, and the palmetto fans, I think they call them pom-poms, the Indians. This is what they used. <clears throat> and uh, we can get in here and pretty well stay out of the weather. This is mosquito bar. We call it mosquito bar. It's 
known as a mosquito net, and the sand flies can come through it, but the mosquitoes can't. And sand flies is always a bother. Over here's the wash tub we bathe in, and we hang stuff up in sacks, corn sacks that we uh, use to put things in, water basin, water bucket. And this turns out pretty good. When you're tired and sleepy, you can go to sleep in there. Don't think for a minute you can't. And the good part of it, there's all kind of wildlife out there singing you to sleep. You can and, stay pretty dry out of weather in here, right? Yeah. And there's no cars coming by or nothing else to wake you up. When you get woke up, it's by a good sounding animal or a bird, something singing to you. Old screech owl now and then through the night. Believe me, this is a peaceful life, even though it looks terrible. But there's no way you could live that piece of a life in Miami, some big city, like you can out here in a shack like this, believe me. What'd you do for entertainment out here? <clears throat> Worked like hell. <laughs> no entertainment, huh? No, we never we never knew what entertainment was. We <clears throat> now and then we got together on weekends and sang and play a little. Very little dancing we ever done here. But uh, some of us played the guitar and some uh, banjo and uh, accordion. Uh, we'd get together and play music and sing. And the smoke always smelled good, and we're getting some of it right now. Lacking any of the conveniences of mainland homes, the islanders' camp life seemed to be an endless round of drudgery. Just doing the laundry was a major project. An unwieldy iron pot was filled with water, a fire built under it. As the water came to a boil, slivers of soap were cut from octagon soap bars and tossed into the water. Then the clothes went into the boiling water and were stirred with a stick. Dirt and stains the boiling water didn't remove were subjected to a scrub board during the rinsing process. For the woman of the camp, this primitive laundry method was hard work, and washing an entire family's clothing usually took the better part of a day. In many of the island camps, meals were cooked over open fires. Without stoves or even rudimentary kitchens, meal preparation was often a lengthy process. There were three main staple foods. Flour, it came in bags from about six pounds to 24, but we usually bought it in a 12 pound bag. Lard, pure lard, came in pound packages in a carton. And uh, I would use the paper, the oil paper that it was wrapped in I remember we had to be so careful. Mother would put those papers in the fry pan with a light fire to get every bit of the oil out of it she could to save it. And uh, we would use that paper to grease the guns. That would hold up much longer than regular oil. And bacon will keep a gun from rusting for months where oil will evaporate. And uh, the pure lard, the flour, and the white bacon, we called it, which is salt pork. Explained earlier, it was salted, 
sold a half inch thick on it. And a uh, few canned goods like corned beef, Brazil puts out a, most of it comes from Brazil, a can of corned beef that we thought was mighty good. I'll never forget in World War II, we couldn't get it and being raised on it, one of the boys here, he finally found a can one day and he towed it around on Chukaluski for a week. Said he didn't know whether to cook it, set it on the shelf and just look at it, eat it right out of the can like we did, or mix it up with tomatoes. And uh, tripe, I remember we had tripe, that's cow belly, canned, canned food. We bought nothing outright except when you would buy some field peas or tomatoes or something from the farmer. We had no ice, so our only way of preserving anything was with salt, smoking it, drying it. And this white bacon come in a whole side of a pig with a layer of salt on it about a half inch thick, and it laid right on the counter. It was only about 15 cents a pound in the depression. And in order to eat it, we had to parboil it, get the salt out of it. You just barely bring it to boil, so it's got to get right out of there now. If you keep boiling it, some say the salt work goes back in it. And then after I parboil it, I'll put it in the fry pan and fry it. And even today, I like it just as good as any breakfast bacon I ever saw. We ate this for a regular meal many times, and we used it in all the seasoning. A pot of beans or peas, anything. We always planned on the white bacon. No breakfast would have been complete without hoe cake, a fried bread similar to Seminole Indian fry bread. And of course, good strong coffee. One thing that occupied a fair amount of time was the collecting of fresh water. Few of the islands had sources of water, so the islanders had to catch rainwater or row long distances to dip water from rivers. We caught rainwater in every way, shape, or form that we could. Anytime we set up a camp, one of the first things we done was set up boards, tarps, anything that would catch rainwater and run it over into a container. <clears throat> and barrels back in those days were used a lot. We had the barrels to store the water in. When we got a lot of rain, we filled up every container we could find, and even to the boats, we'd catch water in the boats, clean them out. And we got river water, we called it, from the rivers. In the uh, rainy season, well, actually about two-thirds of the year, you can get fresh water by going way back inland in the dry season up the rivers and even out as far as Chukaluski Bay in uh, the wet season, like in October. When I was young, in October, you could drink the water in this bay, in Chukaluski Bay, every October. And we just uh, managed all right. It wasn't really no big deal. Like most boys growing up in the islands, Tonch went to work at an early age, making money hunting and trapping raccoons. The animals were plentiful in the islands, and there was steady demand for the pelts. Coon hunting, which Tonch learned from his dad and brother, was done mostly at night. This is a carbide light. Uh, it's what we had when I started out hunting in the 30s. Some call it a miner's cap, a miner's light. And uh, this is the cap. You wear it on the cap like this. And they came out with a bright reflector, but the salt water soon knowing that in this little Romford baking powder can. We cut a hole for the flame to come through and we use this to hunt with. It uses carbide. Carbide's in little quarter inch squares, like stone, and when water touches it, it foams and lets off a gas exactly like propane. 
have water in the water tank here. And I'll let just a little water in it. We didn't have these fancy lighters back then, but it's all I got right now. There she goes. Take it just a minute to get warmed up. It'll put out a little better flame in just a few minutes. But if I turn it on too fast, it'll go and blow its own self out. It's about to get warmed up. There she goes. That isn't a very bright light to compare what they got today, but it worked all right for us back then. Uh, we have rubber on the ore locks here. <clears throat> That's to cut down the noise. Todd spent many a night silently rowing along mangrove shorelines, waiting for his light to be reflected in a raccoon's eyes. When that happened, Tonch was quick on the draw. Most of the coon hunters were also trappers, simply because they had to sell a lot of pelts to feed a family. Todd learned at an early age to set traps. He would cut mangrove roots and build a cage or a pen in three or four inches of water in an area where raccoons would go to feed on crabs and oysters. The pen would have an opening to allow entry. <coughs> Usually the sand flies were so thick you couldn't hardly stand them. If it wasn't sand flies, it'd be mosquitoes. But just the same, I'd go right back down the same old road today. Well, we set the trap now. And again, it's been about 55 years since I set one. But I might and I can still do it. It's going to be bad if I get that in my finger right in front of the camera. And there she is. <clears throat> Usually dig out just a little bit of hole. Some of them so wise they see that trap, no water there. And they're smart enough to stay away from it, believe me. Always set the tongue out that way right in the doorway. Then we cut a root with a fork in it to hold that trap. We stick it down just like this, and then if you've got a root that way, you can run it through there, gives you double up on him. Well, I haven't got this just right. That'll hold him. Now for the bait. I need another forked stick so he can't pull it off of it. That isn't always too easy to find. Let's about do it here. <clears throat> we use salt mullet. They're plentiful. Hand me the bait, sweetheart. Just 
just run it through there. It's all set. And when he comes walking along, he'll go all the way around that pen. And he finds that doorway and he starts in. And it's too bad. Upon returning to camp, the successful hunter or trapper still faced several hours of work, skinning the coons and stretching the pelts to dry. Skinning was an exacting process since a slip of the knife could easily ruin a pelt. This was a boar, and I think they have their young in April. Their cubs, what are you going to call them? That isn't a very large coon. I thought he was about the size of an average key coon, but he's not quite grown. But key coons don't get any, anything like the bigger mainland coon. This is a mainland coon. But this one's gonna have much more fur. I'll go wash it off before I tack it. After the pelts were washed, they were tacked on boards to dry in the sun. A few days later, they were ready to be sold. Sometimes fur traders came to the camps to buy pelts, or the hunters took them into Chukaleski and sold them to Ted Smallwood or traded for supplies. The hunting and trapping of raccoons was simply work, a way of making a living, nothing more. But alligator hunting, that was different. Even today, the sight of a swimming gator, even the mere mention of gator hunting, brings a gleam to Tonch's eyes, a smile to his face. Most fun I ever had in my life was hunting alligators. I'd rather hunt alligators than I had deer. So, something about alligator hunting is a little different from hunting most animals. They're, they're so stupid in some ways and they're so smart in others. And it's kind of a kick to put a little trick on them. You can find one uh, that's wild and can't kill him. So you go up there and find him on the bottom, sitting on the bottom, and give him hell with that pole, a gator hook. And then he's scared of what's in the water, so he'll go out to the land, <laughs> walk around, crawl around through the roots. At about the same time young Tatch was becoming a coon hunter, he was also learning how to hunt alligators a far more dangerous and challenging pursuit. Gator hunting became a passion. In the 20s and 30s, gators were plentiful year round, and the gator hunters followed them from the Everglades to the 10,000 islands and back. In the summer rainy season, alligators followed the flow of fresh and brackish water from the Everglades, deep into the creeks and rivers of the islands, often taking up temporary residence around the bird rookeries. Careless ibis, egrets, and herons became easy meals for the always hungry gators. For the most part, the gator hunters worked at night. Gators were easier to find in darkness since their eyes reflected the hunters' lights. Well, in the old days, we started out with a rowboat, so we rowed every place we went. But then we began to get the power boats. In fact, we never had many power boats. There were very, very few. Uh, then as we began to get the power boats, we would tow our hunting skiff along, and when we saw a gator, we'd stop, anchor the boat, get in the rowboat, and row in there as quiet as we possibly could to kill the gator. But then we found that we could run the motorboat right up to them. At first it didn't work because we would cut the engine off and uh, cutting the motor off would scare the gator. But we found to throw it out of gear, neutral, and then uh, 
the boat would just coast up. We'd throw it out of gear just before we got in gun range, run to the bow with the rifle, and just let the boat coast up with the engine still running and get right up on him and kill him. When the flow of fresh water ended, the gators, disliking salt water, moved back to the Everglades. And in times of drought, they would leave their normal habitat and range across the grasslands in search of lakes or small pools of water. At such times, hunters had to use different techniques. They dragged small boats across the grasslands to the lakes. Todd brought his old hunting boat out of a museum to show it off. I call this a pit pan. It's a little gator boat I built out of one sheet of plywood, light, and enough to drag across the grasslands of the Everglades while the alligators in hibernation to go out and hunt them in little lakes and ponds. This is the gator hook. When I kill the gator, I use this hook to reach down on the bottom, hook him up, and to pole with. This is my little rifle. I had to use a smaller gun than a started out with a 12 gauge shotgun, but I cut down to a small rifle because of the noise. This rifle has killed a many an alligator. The rifles wear out on the barrel of a gun <clears throat> right near the end. And you can saw off uh, about a half inch and start all over. Well, this one's been sawed off three or four times. And it's a 22 Magnum. This is my skinning knife. I break off the knife and uh, cut it back like this so it'll slide along and not dig into the meat, cutting this way on the gator. The gator's uh, hide is saved from right along here down, just the belly part and all of the bottom. This is the pattern in here, and if there was a hole cut in at the size of a pencil lead, we were docked a third. This is a pack, corn sack, burlap bag. I throw that over my shoulder and carry some of my supplies in that, my bed row. And I caught the boat right here and drug drag it across the glades. In times of drought, there would often be so many gators gathered in a lake that a single hunter could reap a bonanza of as many as 200 gators in a single day. In those days, only the heights were marketed. That was long before the meat of the gator's tail came to be considered a delicacy. As was the case with raccoon pelts, traders came to the hunters' camps to buy the gator skins. And hunters also sold them to Ted Smallwood at his Chukalusky store or traded for food and necessities. By the 1950s, unregulated hunting had placed the Everglades alligator population in danger. The state banned further hunting, and another way of making a living was lost to the islanders. To this day, though, Tonch still goes out in search of gators. He loves to take visitors to his old gator haunts just to observe, and sometimes get a thrill. Hunting, fishing, farming, and harvesting wood were about the only means of making a living for the people spread out through the vast reaches of the 10,000 islands. When times really got tough in the depths of the Depression, Tancha's dad made moonshine whiskey. More than a half century later, the foundation of his original still remains intact on an island only Tanch could find. He recreated a non-working model based on his memory and an old photograph of the still. Well, I'm coming down the old trail through the mangroves to the old liquor still. We're going back the ceiling to uh, the 1930, early 1930s. In the Depression, it was really hard in this country, and my family came into the 
woods and lived off of the land, on the land and from it for several years, about four. And during that time, Dad was cutting boat timbers, killing alligators and raccoons in the winter. That wasn't enough to make a go of it, so he started making moonshine. And uh, to keep from getting caught by the revenueers, he built his own little shell mound out in the mangroves no one knew anything about. We hauled the shell in here and piled it out on a kind of a high-like place. He set up the still, and we run shine here probably about three years. The beer's been set for a week. It's ready to go, stop working as we call it. We'll pour the, we call it buck. We'll strain that first. Get the corn out. This smells mighty good to me. <laughs> now, I believe it smells good to these mosquitoes too. And we'll pour it now into the still. Pour this good old juice in there and make us something to drink. Now this will come out white like gin. Put it back on? Or vodka, yeah. Well, we've got the fire going now. It'll take a little while for it to get heated up good and start boiling. And when it does, the steam will come down this pipe go down into this barrel. The barrel has a round copper tubing in it, and it's full of cool water, just tap water, and when the steam hits this coil, it's condensed then into shine, we call it. It will come out this little pipe down here at the bottom, just a very slow drip. Sometimes, if you're working it just right, it'll come out just a small pour. Well, it's just beginning to start now. It'll start getting faster and faster as it boils, but you have to be very careful. If you boil it too fast, then it does what we call puking, and the beer and all comes out. So we catch it in small containers to keep from mixing up the beer with the real whiskey. Water's getting hot in the barrel now, so we have to change the water. I let pull this plug, go all the way to the bottom, the hot water's going out the gutter there, getting out of the way. And when it gets empty, I put this plug back in it. Bring the bucket, sweetheart, we'll change the water. This is cement vats, it was two, but he knocked the middle, the sides out of in there later for some reason, I don't know. The reason for the vats, there was a bug that Dad named Prohibition Bug. They went into the barrels, we had six barrels over there with a the buck set in it, and uh, we got up one morning, all the barrels were leaking. The bugs had gone into them, they liked alcohol, they're similar to termites, but smaller. He made a bunch of little uh, sticks. We all went to plug in the barrels, but the bugs outdone us. We went out the coast, about three or four miles out the coast, got sand, shell, and he managed to get some cement, and he made these vats to set the buck in. That didn't work because the beer actually ate the lining off of this cement. Excuse me, he said he had fixed that, so he plastered it with a plaster Paris and ate that off. But this time he did fix them. He went over to the barrels, wrapped chicken wire around them, and plastered the entire barrels. And that turned the bugs away. With so few means of making a living available, islanders were not above breaking the law at times to put food on the table. From moonshining to plume hunting to gator poaching to smuggling, the islanders found ways to survive the hard times. But the illegal activities were usually the exception. 
In between seasons, or when fish and game were scarce, there was always buttonwood to be harvested. This hardwood grew among the mangroves and was easily accessible to woodcutters in boats. It's a good firewood, especially good. It's hard, sinks like lead, and it grows best in the back country like we're out here today. We're in Chevalier Bay, uh, Bay Sunday, excuse me, and the water's brackish, and this wood tends to grow better than it does out near the coast here. And in the early days, the first settlers, one of their lead ways of making a go of it, which they had very few, was cutting the buttonwood for heating purposes. They cut it with an ax, a good heavy sharp ax, a hand cross-cut saw made of two or three boards and a turnbuckle and a blade. And uh, they cut it by the cord. Cord is four by four by eight foot, 128 cubic feet. They got about $3 a cord for it. They uh, hauled it by rowboat mostly out to uh, Chukaluski Bay to the sailboat, loaded it on the sailboat, sent it to Key West, and there the people in Key West used it and distributed it out here and there through the country, and much of it went all the way to New York by Mallory steam lines. And they also made charcoal out of it. They would pile up a bunch of the wood, set it afire, then pile mud on it, and then another bunch of wood on top of that, and someone had to stay there and keep, the, keep it from catching a fire. It just burned without flame and turned to charcoal, so they poured water on it and put it out when it was burned just enough, or it would continue burning when you set it afire again, just like charcoal. It should be noted that at the turn of the century, Key West was the wealthiest city in the U.S. and the most important port in Florida. At that time, Miami and Tampa were just small outposts. Key West was the only market for most products of the 10,000 islands, and that was still true in Tatcha's early days. On the vegetables, vegetables farming was a big industry here, very much. It may not have been no big deal, but just about everybody except a real hunter that was nothing but a hunter and a fisherman done farming. <clears throat> One of the lead crops was sugarcane. Most every place it would grow it had sugarcane growing on it. And there was two or three mills around to grind the cane, we call it. Runs through a couple of tight rollers, mashes juice out. And then it's put into a kettle, a steel kettle. We call it a serp kettle. It's a steel like a bowl, shaped just like a bowl, five foot across it. Build a fire under it, boil it down till it becomes syrup. There was always a uh, pumpkins, I don't know if I mentioned that, there's a lot of pumpkins, squash, tomatoes, field peas, black-eyed peas, okra, practically anything they grow here in Florida today, except this modern stuff they've come up with. And these islands, you wouldn't believe how this shell would grow that stuff. The lime or something in this shell turned out a much firmer vegetable than you can grow anywhere on the mainland. The man Tosh calls the desperado Bloody Ed Watson was, for a few years, the major farmer in the islands. On a large property on Chatham River, Watson grew fruit, vegetables, sugar cane, and produced cane syrup, which he shipped to Key West on his own sailing vessel. Even though Tosh's ancestors were farmers, and he helped his dad farm the Watson place after Ed Watson was killed, Tatch always made his own living from the rich waters of the islands. And making a living meant Tatch didn't have a whole lot of time for schooling. Well, I didn't get a lot of schooling like many of the rest of us. Uh, I started at Everglades City. I was born in 20. Collier started Everglades City in 23. In time I was five or six years old to start school, he had a school going there. Of course, the old timers already had a Palmetto Shack school, but I went a couple of years in Everglades City, and then we left and went to the woods in a depression when he 
came out of the woods after about four or five years. I went to school at Chukaluski into the seventh grade. They had a school there that taught through the seventh grade. And uh, I then went to work and quit school, period. Then in the later years, uh, probably in the 40s, the school board managed to get up uh, enough money to have a school boat built with a lot of winders in it, just like a school bus. And they'd take the kids to Everglades to high school from Chukaluski, about a four mile run. Tynch was in his early teens when he started mullet fishing. Unlike today, the waters of the 10,000 islands in the 1920s and 30s were rich with mullet, and there was a healthy market for the catch in Key West. Setting the net from a rowboat and hauling it back in, usually several times a day, or until the boat was full, was backbreaking work. One hit down there already. So one hit. You might have went through it. There. Right of it. Over here. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. They're jumping all over. Watch out, he'll fall out, he's so big. Oh, <laughs> All right, Trub. <laughs> Trub must like them mullet as good as I do. Not a better fish to eat that swims. I got one coming right here. There's a big, fat mullet right here that I'm about to cover up. I got him. Okay. This is a, a nice mullet. <clears throat> mullet that's caught here in the more saltier water and not real muddy bottom are the best fish to eat that we've got. But mullet caught up a river and fresh water and on muddy bottom. They're almost black and they have a strong taste and we don't even eat them ourselves. And that's one problem why so many people don't think mullet are good to eat. If mullet are caught at the right place and the right time of the year when they got a little fat in them like now, to us, there's not a better fish that swims, and we catch pompano, the most expensive fish in the world, I guess. And I'd rather have a mullet any day of the week. And again, look how simple they come out of the net. For the mullet fishermen, the day didn't end with the last pulling of a net. With no ice to preserve the catch, the fish had to be cleaned and prepared for shipping, a chore that often lasted late into the night. Stacker laid the fish here in this position, ready for the splitter. And the splitter, I'm not gonna be able to do it, but the splitter made one lick like that all the way down and laid that fish open. Scored them one time right down there to the skin, one time there, but that was just done in a flash. He was so fast. The gutter was standing here, he done the gutting had gloves on, and he could really rake those things out of there. They stacked over here, then the solder took them and soldered them. After salting, they laid them over on the table, and the stacker again stacked them over in place to drain. To eat these fish, they were soaked overnight in plenty of fresh water and sometimes parboil them, bring them to a boil, 
and then prepare them however you like, but stewed, uh, we called it stewed, just kind of boiled with onions and potatoes, was very, very good. And we used them also for the coon bait in the trapping days for trapping coons. Salt mullet is what we used it. Todd spent 25 years fishing for mullet until the advent of Everglades National Park brought an end to such commercial fishing within park waters in the early 1950s. During Tonch's early years, clams, big clams, were plentiful in some areas of the islands. One of the only ways the early settlers had of making a living was clamming, they called it. Uh, some people set up a clam factory up around Marco or Goodland and canned clams and they were gathered by hand diggers. They put on, they made their own shoes, or what are you gonna call them, slippers, out of canvas, uh, just barely stay on their foot and thin. And they walked around on the sand bottom, the sand bottom out here that's on the water. They walked around on their heels like this and they felt a hard place, that would be the clam sitting up this way and they had a fork made of a heavy file or something, two-pronged fork. They reached down and stuck onto the clam, popped him out of the sand. Had a little old boat about four, six foot long, square box light tied to their waist, usually working in water about foot deep, low tide only. <clears throat> They'd gather those clams, throw them over into the little boat, and they were so plentiful that they could dig as much as 30 bushel in one day. But then someone designed a clam dredge. It was like a conveyor belt. This had a suction down in the water like a suction dredge, and it dumped everything it sucked from the bottom over on the wide conveyor belt. And the belt rolled up out of the water with two or three men sitting along on each side of the belt picking up the clams as they come by them. The more clams they were in, the more people they had there picking them up and putting them in the baskets. Todd said a poison in the water killed off the clams, conchs, sponges, and stone crabs. When he returned from World War II, clamming was just a memory, and only the stone crabs came back. During his lifetime in the islands, Todd tried many forms of fishing. He was a pompano fisherman for years, alternating that with mullet fishing. He also fished for stone crabs and crawfish. He even spent five years as a guide taking such luminaries as Arthur Godfrey to the snook and tarpon hotspots. The catching of turtles for shipment to Key West was a major industry in the islands at the turn of the century. And Totch probably would have been a turtler himself. But the industry had died out by the time he started fishing. There was great demand for sharks. And Totch's brother Bert was a shark fisherman for a time. Totch never joined him. He said it was too much work for too little payoff. Commercial fishermen, hunters, farmers once ruled these islands, but things are different now. Islanders now cater to tourists, campers, weekend anglers. It's no longer the private domain of Totch Brown and the small number of families who settle this region. But Totch can always jump in his boat and find the quiet places, the secret places in the 10,000 islands where he can call up the memories of the past and reflect on the hard life, which in retrospect doesn't seem so hard. Again, it wasn't all that bad. It seemed like it was hell, but I wouldn't trade it for this thing that's going on here today. No way. Like I've always said, I'd trade all of my tomorrows for a few days in my yesterday's overlaid. Crowd down the rivers are getting drunk on sea grape wine. I'm getting high watching eagles fly, having myself a time. Wet my whistle every now and then with a sip of cool Gatorade. And watch the sun go down, let the world go round, down in the Everglades. There ain't gonna be no hurry. Ain't gonna be no rush Just a crazy style Like a crocodile Laying in the mangrove brush I'll float on down the river Let speedboats speed away 
I'll drift around while the gators sound. 